Um, okay. Anybody know what? Uh, anybody a diver around here? Uh, dive in the ocean and stuff. Okay. What did we learn from the book Brooklyn Bridge about diving? Can use Can use uh, uh, Yeah, in a sense. The first time anyone ever discovered the bends was was from building the caissons for the Brooklyn Bridge. What they did for the Brooklyn Bridge, which was a fairly innovative, it was at the time it was one of the engineering marvels of the age. Um, but you've got here's the river, and right, here's the land, okay, up here, and here's your river, and you want to you want to build a foundation, and you want to get down to bedrock. And how do you do it? Well, they basically built some uh, caissons, which are basically floating um, uh, pieces. That they would sink those to the bottom. They would sit on the bottom of the, the East River, right, in New York. And then they basically had some pipes and tubes that came down from up here. And people would go down, and they had an airlock in here, and they pressurized it to keep the water out, so they had a higher pressure here than here. And people basically dug the dirt out from underneath, and the caisson would just sink down deeper and deeper as they dug the dirt out. And they take that dirt out the airlock, and the people would go up the airlock. Well, it turns out, after they got down two, three hundred feet, the people going through the airlock, when they would come back out, they would get all these cramps. And it was basically the beginning of the bends, because they were bringing just, they were breathing just compressed air down there. And the nitrogen was getting in their blood at a higher pressure, and several of them died. And there was there were big debates as whether you should go through the air, airlock quickly or slowly. Okay, obviously you should go through slowly to denitrogenate your blood, but uh, that's how they learned about the bends for all you divers, right? The bends being the fact that as the higher pressure dissolves nitrogen into your bloodstream. Uh, when you go back to lower pressure, it all basically your blood boils as the nitrogen comes out, and when you start clogging up your veins with uh, with nitrogen gas rather than liquid, your blood qu quits flowing and it's not a good thing. Okay, um, but that was all part of the book. This one of the things we learned during the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. I remember it well. Anyway, okay. Any other questions? Let's go ahead and get started. Today we're going to talk about material selection. Actually, we're not going to talk. Just about material selection, we're going to talk about building things. Oh, great. Let me get those lights off. Here we go. Um, this came out of the uh, Christian Science Monitor, 1987, still old. Now, uh, the Graduate School of Business. Now, I know you all want to make money, but today we're going to discuss making things, actual things. And the student down here says, things, I don't want to make things. I want, the other one says, I want to make money. And the other, third one says, listen, let's sue the business school. We can make some money that way. And actually, there are some companies that actually take this approach to making money. They can't do it in the marketplace. They can't do it with innovative products. So they try to do it with innovative attorneys. Um, but nonetheless, we're going to try to talk about the materials of uh, which we make things, actual things. Now. There's a uh, professor who used to be at Harvard, went back to his home in uh, England, uh, went to Cambridge University, very innovative professor who uh, had some interesting ways of looking at things. This guy named Mike Ashby, he just retired about a year ago. Um, and he wrote a book a few years ago, 10 or so, called Material Selection and Mechanical Design. Um, and in this, uh, book somewhere in the beginning is this plot where he tries to look at materials through the ages. And he looks at metals, which back in the Stone Age uh, was not really used. To, uh, they wouldn't have called it the Stone Age if they had metals. Uh, about the only metal they had was gold. They did have some native copper uh, that you could pick up off the ground. Um, they had polymers and elastomers, except they, they were natural ones, wood, skins, and, and uh, fibers off of plants. Composites, well, they take straw and, and uh, clay and they make bricks. And so that's the type of composites in the old days. And then they had uh, the big use of materials was either um, organic materials, which he calls polymers and elastomers, uh, 
and then ceramics and glasses, stone and flint and stuff. This is not exactly a linear scale. You go from 10,000 BC up here to 1900 and 1940. <clears throat> anyway, so this is sort of a compressed at this end of the scale. But over here we have fancy um, super duper uh, polymers. He shows the decline of the metals industry. Um, he shows composites uh, ever expanding and ceramics and glasses uh, taking on a, a more useful role. Now over the next couple of days, um, I will challenge some of these assumptions that we're going to see more and more of these materials. Um, he may be right that in terms of number of applications, we'll probably end up using each one of them, each one of these four classes of materials, at least for structural applications, which is what he's talking about. We're not talking about electronic materials and things like that here, because uh, it came out of a book in mechanical design. We're not doing, we're not designing computer chips here. Um, but in any case, uh, he showed a tremendous growth in the metals uh, business uh, through, well, he shows it kind of peaking in, uh, in the, the lowest part of this valley, which is the peak for metals, is somewhere around the 1950s. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it and see how much all that comes to pass. Uh, uh, see if I can convince you a little bit differently. Now, there have been some tremendous strides in... Uh, making things. This is a plot came out of a National Academy's report um, about high temperature materials for jet engines. Well, why do we why do we want higher temperature materials for jet engines? Anybody have an idea? Take thermodynamics? Efficiency. Thermodynamic efficiency goes up as the operating temperature goes up because it's operating temperature minus the ambient temperature divided by the ambient temperature is the efficiency, the theoretical maximum efficiency. Uh, if I remember that correctly, from you get that out of the second, combining the second, first and second laws of thermodynamics um, in terms of efficiency. Anybody ha have any idea how much um, efficiency is worth in the commercial aircraft engine business? For example, what 50 degrees Fahrenheit increase in operating temperature? They talk in Fahrenheit in that business. They're, they haven't learned about centigrade yet. Um, In fuel savings, 50 degrees Fahrenheit would save the commercial airlines in the United States $2 billion a year in fuel costs. So you're not talking trivial amounts of money. Um, and so they will pay tremendous prices. I think I said the other day, this little turbine blade grown as a single crystal is worth $4,000 if it was good. Okay, And there's more than one of these in an engine. In fact, there's hundreds of these in the engine. And those engines are five to ten million dollars a piece for a, a big aircraft today. Well, for if you go back to the um, 19, early 1950s when the first turbines or jets were being built, actually the jet engine was invented in the 1930s by this guy named Whipple in England. Um, but it, it really they didn't have jet aircraft. Well, the the Germans had designed some at the end of World War II. And they were using them basically on kamikaze type flights into uh, uh, England. They <clears throat> they didn't uh, they didn't tell the pilots they were kamikaze flights, but the reliability of the engine was such that you might as well have been a kamikaze. Um, and then it was uh, Chuck Yeager and breaking the sound bay area. I don't remember. It was like 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. They actually had the the, the Bell XB2 uh, or whatever it was. Uh, that was uh, the jet that broke the sound barrier or whatever. Um, and they, they were operating down here in the seven to 800, seven, well, the material had a 700 degree temperature and the uh, firing temperature of the engine in the combustion chamber was around 800 degrees centigrade. And this stuff kind of crept up as they got better materials. And then in the mid 60s, really, they just weren't able to improve the temperature of the materials at the same type of rate because there's only certain types of materials that work. Uh, you can use nickel, you can use cobalt alloys, um, but that's kind of the work workhorse. And there are higher temperature metals. There's tungsten, there's tantalum, there's niobium. They tend to oxidize um, at these high temperatures. And you can't, well, we haven't developed coatings. We did show coatings technology here, which is actually a thermal barrier coating. It's, it, it does provide some oxidation resistance. But you'll still, at these high temperatures, have oxygen diffuse right through that and would oxidize the metal underneath if you don't uh, 
have something that has good oxidation resistance inherent to it. Plus, if you had a little break in the coating, you wouldn't want to lose the whole engine because the uh, material wasn't immune. So people kept on trying, and they still try. They went to better and better structures. They went from polycrystalline to uh, directionally solidified, I think. Um, I don't remember. Directionally solidified came into commercial use somewhere in the, in the 70s. This is directionally solidified GTD 111. It's an interesting material because uh, it started being used in the uh, 1980s. The patent office just issued a patent on it uh, in the last couple of years. They applied for the patent in like 1980, and they never got the patent, and they kept General Electric kept on trying to get this patent. They finally got it a couple of years ago. So in the meantime, everybody figured this was an unpatented material. They put it into their engines and uh, uh, figuring they didn't have to pay royalties General Electric. And now, 20 years later, the Patent Office issues the patent, and General Electric is now threat threatening all these people with huge royalties. Okay, So this is a real cash cow for General Electric until people injure their, their way around it. And they will, um, because a patent is only valuable if it's kind of in a very narrow range in the middle. If, it's, if it doesn't have any real value, then obviously no one's going to pay for it. If it has a lot of value, then people are either going to steal it in some way or they're going to engineer their way around it. Uh, it's worth spending the money to engineer your way around it. In any case, the metal temperature didn't go up very much. They started growing single crystals. The reason they wanted to get rid of the grain boundaries is because in high temperature creep, the metals fail at the grain boundaries. They separate at the grain boundaries. So grain boundaries are bad. There are areas of weakness for high temperatures. So they first went to orient all the grain boundaries parallel with the stress direction. So they were basically in shear, and that wasn't a problem. It was the tensile grain boundaries that were a problem. And then they finally went to single crystals, which is what we use today. And most of the high performance uh, turbine blades in jet engines today are single crystal blades. And most of them are coated um, for thermal barrier. And what happened is they, they actually didn't stop. They kept on improving things. And what happened here in the late 80s Anybody know what this jump is in firing temperature? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's the cooling. It's the internal cooling. It turns out that this, uh, if you look at this, the firing temperature is up here around 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the actual, in the combustion ch chamber, it's even hotter. The gases going past this thing are higher than the melting point of the alloy. Why? Because we have all these cooling passages. So we form a boundary layer that insulates this and protects it. So the, what, one of the things they learned, um, or people have learned over the years, uh, material scientists tend to still think that you solve all problems by coming up with a better material. You don't always solve all the problems. Sometimes the materials just can't do it, so you change your design. You go, I mean, the material scientists did come up with single crystals, um, and the material scientists had to figure out how to create the cooling passages, but the next step was not a material solution, it was a cooling solution, a design problem. Uh, I sometimes like to tell the story, there was a, oh, it was a MiG-25 or something, this was around 1980 or so, uh, some North Korean pilot decided to defect to South Korea and he flew one of the Soviet Union's latest and greatest uh, fighters into South Korea. Of course, the North Koreans and the Soviets said, return our ship, our, our aircraft, and um, and the, the South Koreans and the U.S. government did actually, of course, the U.S. government didn't have anything to do with it, right? Um, but uh, they did actually return it about three months later after they had taken it apart down to each little piece and then put it back together to find out what was in it. I was at a conference around 1980, and someone got up and said, well, I understand that we don't, this is actually someone from a steel company, says, I understand we don't need these fancy materials like titanium forgings for, for jet aircraft because he had heard that this fighter, the Soviet fighter, had performance capabilities similar to some of the best uh, U.S. Air Force fighters. And he said, well, and I understand they had steel, steel forgings. They didn't have uh, titanium forgings. And a guy from Wright Pat Air Force Base was in the meeting. He says, let me speak to that. He says, what we learned uh, from this was that you can get as much by design improvements as you can by materials improvements. All through the 50s and 60s in the United States, we were pu pushing materials improvements. 
thinking you get higher and higher performance with better and better materials. But in fact, what he ended up, what they found from that experience with the Soviets, the Soviets didn't have the same type of materials technology. They had to be more clever at design. And their performance came from design. Well, it turns out the performance of fighter aircraft after 1980 really took off because all of a sudden the United States learned that you could use both materials and design to push yourself forward. There's not always, the point is, there's not always a single solution to a given problem. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about metals before we get into uh, other types of materials. But if we talk about metals, uh, this is a plot that uh, surprises a lot of people. It turns out for every 100 pounds of metals produced in the world, 95 pounds is steel. And it turns out aluminum is the next most common, down by about a factor of 40 at less than 2% of the total metals production in the world. Then copper, zinc, and everything else is down here, you know, in the noise. Why is steel the most used material? There's a couple of reasons. There's actually two basic reasons. Well, it's got, it's got, it's got, uh, yeah, that fatigue limit is one of the, is a subclass of one of the reasons. You got better properties in steel. And to show you better properties, Ashby's book here, uh, he actually has an addendum. The book is copyrighted. It's kind of an interesting approach. He has a supplement when you buy this $300 book. Um, you get this for free. And this is not copyrighted. And it's specifically not copyrighted so that you can copy the figures that are in here and use it for teaching. So that's interesting. Anyway, Ashby's got a whole series of plots, and I'll show you some others. But this is cost versus strength of essentially all the structural materials you would hope to think of. Uh, here down here are the elastomers. Well, we know elastomers aren't very strong. This is a log-log scale. And of course, you put things on a log-log scale, you ought to be able to put everything on a log-log scale. And that's essentially what he's done. Here's cement and concrete. We know it's low cost, so it's way down at this end of the uh, um, the x-axis, and its cost is not too high. It's not, it's not quite as cheap as balsa wood, but uh, um, it's uh, um, right in here. If we go up here, basically what you want is low cost and high strength. So you want to move up into this corner. Well, if I move up into this corner, what are the cheapest materials? Mild steel, stone. OK? We're going to see in a little bit, when, thing, when something is cheap, we tend to use lots of it. Okay. Uh, it turns out if you look at this in absolute strength, well, some of these ceramics have almost an order of magnitude higher strength than steel, but or in fact, or three higher strength than steel. But what's wrong with ceramics? This is strength now. Brittle. They're brittle. So if you look at toughness. I don't know if I have. Uh, I do. I well, I'll, show you. I'll show you toughness later. And ceramics fall off in toughness. But here's another one. If you want something that's stiff, looking at properties, um, you'll find, again, high stiffness versus cost. Uh, you'll find the ceramics are up here, but the steels, this is mild steels and stainless steels right in here, are well up on there. Now, relatively cost versus stiff, here's your stones and your brick and stuff, because again, we're on a cost axis. Polymers are down in here, and you get down here to elastomers and stuff that are not stiff at all, obviously. They're flexible. And sometimes you want flexibility, but not always. So the, if you're looking at any type of structural material, the number one criteria is cost. There's no question about it, it's cost. Why? It's not cost when you're talking about silicon and something electronic materials, cost is not the primary object. Uh, now, the final fabricated cost may be a big deal in silicon. But you know, as Professor Fitzgerald uh, always likes to say, well, you take sand and you turn it into a computer chip. Well, there's a few steps in between, OK? Uh, and there's a little bit of energy that goes in, and therefore the cost goes up with energy every time you do one of those processing steps. But when you're talking a structural material, you're not talking about little microscopic things. Uh, you're talking about big things. You have to span the East River with the Brooklyn Bridge. 
that takes a lot of whatever it is. I don't care if you build it out of wood. I don't care if you build it out of stone or steel or titanium. The thing is, if you build it out of titanium, titanium is not a cheap material inherently, and we'll talk about that in a second. The next thing for structural materials is not just strength, but it's fracture resistance, which is toughness. What's the difference between uh, strength and toughness? Anybody know? Strength, or strength is the force of fracture, and toughness is the energy of fracture. And you all know that force and energy aren't the same, right? Force through a distance is energy, right? Well, in fact, something that will stretch, you have to apply that force over a big distance, which means there's a lot of energy to that thing that stretches. If something's brittle, you have to apply the force over a very short distance, which means there's, you can have a high force but very little energy. Um, one example I like to give of toughness is paper. Something is brittle, if it breaks, usually you can put the two pieces back together and they, they align. I mean, you ever broken a piece of glass or something and you put it back together and you glue it back together with some crazy, crazy glue, everything fits, right? Because the glass doesn't deform as it fractures. Now, if I took something that's rubbery and I fracture it and try to put it back together, the stuff deformed, or a piece of metal typically, is going to deform and you try to put the pieces back together, they don't fit. So it turns out paper is a brittle material. And one of the things about brittle materials is if they have no flaws, they can be fairly strong. So I can take a piece of paper and I can pull on it like that with several pounds of force. However, if I put a little notch in it, it doesn't have to be a very big notch, it takes almost no force. I go from pounds to ounces with a little quarter inch notch in there. You ever seen anybody break glass? They take a little silicon carbide or diamond tool and they scratch it. They can even scratch it in a fancy pattern and they whack it. It breaks right where you scratched it. Why? No toughness in brittle materials. Okay? So, um, cost, strength, fracture resistance, availability. Well, that's a pretty important thing in some cases. And in fact, if we look at the availability of, uh, of iron, um, it turns out that on the Earth, in the Earth's crust, the most common element, actually the most common element everywhere except the atmosphere, is oxygen. And oxygen is number two in the atmosphere. So we got the crust, the oceans, and the atmosphere. But oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and iron. So iron is 5% of the Earth's, Earth's crust. That's a fair amount. There's a lot of iron around. Well, why don't we use aluminum instead of iron? Because there's more aluminum than there is iron. We do. We make bricks out of aluminum, you know, clays that have a lot of aluminum in them. Why don't we use aluminum metal? It costs a lot to refine. It costs a lot to refine. Very good. Aluminum oxide is much more stable than iron oxide. If I look at the approximate energy content, um, aluminum has an energy content of 300 gigajoules per ton, whatever that is, as a unit, sort of like furlongs per fortnight as a velocity. Plastics are about 100 gigajoules. Copper is 100, rising to 500. We'll talk about that in a second. Zinc steel is 50. Steel is six times less in energy content to go from iron oxide to iron than going from aluminum oxide to aluminum metal. Aluminum oxide is very, very stable. It's called sapphire if it's in a single crystal nature state. Uh, natural state um, as aluminum oxide. And as a result, unless someone comes up with a new set of thermodynamic principles in terms of the stability of the aluminum oxygen bond and the iron oxygen bond, you can expect that aluminum will usually cost about six times as much as steel. Guess what the ratio of steel to aluminum price is per pound right now? It's about a factor six. If you can buy steel for 20 cents a pound, you're going to pay a buck 20 for aluminum. And that's about right, right now, because it's energy cost. Now, oh, this one, this was in 1980. This, this actually came out of another one of Ashby's books, an earlier one. It says copper, 100 rising to 500. Anybody know why uh, it would be rising to 500? <laughs> 
think of the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is, uh, basically says that as things tend to become more disordered, turns out the best ores for copper ores used to be 2 to 5 percent copper. But in fact, the typical ores that people are mining, there's only a couple of copper mines left in the United States. In fact, the biggest mine in the United States is an open pit mine outside of Salt Lake City, Utah. They, it's now a tourist attraction because they closed it down. But the copper content of the ore was less than a half percent. So you have to dig up lots of dirt, which takes lots of energy to get that same amount. Now, if you go to um, Zaire, in the middle of Africa, they have copper ores that are 5%. You just have to fight the gorillas and the Ebola virus and things like that at the same time. So that kind of raises your cost, plus you got to ship it back to somewhere where they can use it, okay, or they want to pay for it, or they have the funds to pay for it, um, whatever the case may be. So um, if things are widely dispersed, now, one of the things that made steel less expensive and helped build the steel industry in the United States to such a tremendous capacity uh, around World War II is we had the Mesabi Range. Anybody know what the Mesabi Range is or was or where it was? It was in, yeah, Joe? No. Minnesota. The Mesabi Range was an iron ore uh, bed in Minnesota at the end of Lake Superior. And so that's where all the ore shipping from uh, up there down through the Great Lakes to Chicago down towards uh, Pennsylvania and, and, and then by rail into Pittsburgh for the steel industry. The Mesabi Range, I think, was 40% iron. Now, there it turns out there are still mountains in Australia and Brazil that are 40% iron. And as a result, that's where people go to get their iron ore now. Um, the Mesabi Range was, we basically dug it all out by the 60s and 70s. And so the American steel industry put in huge um, capacities to, to mine taconite, which is like 5 or 10% iron. Well, you've got to dig up a lot more other stuff and throw it back, you know, throw it back in the ground. Uh, so that all adds into cost. But availability comes into other things. Um, what's an important material now that's not a common material? Think of... Can you think of anything? I mean, silicon is cheap, right? Platinum. platinum and palladium. Platinum and palladium are platinum group ores, and there are platinum group ores that have platinum, um, but there's just there's not a lot of those. Okay, anybody know why there's not as much? I mean, you can go back to what's the you know percentage of something in the Earth's crust, and this is this is in order, and you platinum and palladium are going to be way down on the list. They're way down on the list because it turns out the elements were formed. Anybody know where the heavy elements were formed? <coughs> Nobody knows? They were formed in a, uh, a nuclear reactor, right? No. Actually, they were formed in a nature's nuclear reactor, a supernovae. Okay? When the sun burns, it burns hydrogen and helium, and maybe bigger stars might burn some lithium or something, but they can't really burn big heavy elements. The heavy elements are actually made when a supernova explodes in space. <laughs> and um, so whenever these supernova exploded, that's when we get the heavy elements. And it turns out the most stable nucleus happens to be number 56, which is called iron. So that's why there's a lot of iron. And some of these others, like platinum and palladium, their nuclei are not as stable, and so you don't form as many of them in the supernova explosion, and there's just, they're not present in, 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 uh, um, in the universe in anywhere near the same types of concentration. Well, there are some elements, so did anybody think of a, another element besides platinum and palladium? Actually, there's one in the platinum group metals, which is they only produce a couple hundred ounces, or like a hundred ounces a year of the one I'm thinking of. It's called iridium. It's one of the platinum group metals. Anybody know what the major use of iridium? There's actually two major root uses of iridium. Anyone ever heard of iridium? Actually, I made my wife's engagement ring out of platinum iridium. Okay. Had to electron beam melt it. Uh, there are some superconductors. Uh, in fact, that's how I got the iridium at the time. One of the big uses at the time was to iridium melts at around 3,000 degrees centigrade, very oxidation resistant. In fact, uh, 
I remember when I took uh, uh, high temperature materials from Professor Grant the first day of class, he says, well, what material could you make turbine blades out of and go to higher temperatures and not worry about oxidation? And the answer was, which none of us got, was platinum. Now, you may not be able to afford the turbine blade, but you know you can make very good turbine blades that will go to very high temperatures. Platinum melts to 1700C. So you could get to 12, 13, 1400 C. It'd be a little heavy because you don't want heavy rotating components, but you could make platinum turbine blades if you wanted. In any case, um, um, I, when I made my wife's engagement ring, there, were, there was, the iridium was $400 an ounce. Platinum was about $400 an ounce. But there was a speculator's market. The speculator's market for iridium was about $1,600 an ounce. But you couldn't buy it. I called up Englehard. And they wouldn't sell it to me. Why? Why was the speculators' market? Because people had just learned to grow artificial um, diamonds as sapphires. Okay, basically uh, different types of uh, uh, spinels and stuff. And in order to grow that from that oxide melt, they had to use iridium crucibles because it was too high a temperature for the platinum, and they needed a high temperature platinum metal, and so they were using iridium. And there's only about 100 ounces a year of iridium produced because it's a byproduct of producing platinum. And platinum's not exactly plentiful. And iridium is, you know, not plentiful squared, okay, so far as that goes. Um, well, so I basically, uh, I convinced Engelhard to let me buy it um, uh, because I told him I was working on superconductivity, which I was. I was working on niobium-3 uh, aluminum. But there was a niobium-3 iridium superconductor, so I... I actually bought a half an ounce of iridium uh, so I can make my wife's engagement ring. Um, and I purchased it through MIT and paid them back through my, my thesis advisor's account. Um, but the other big deal, so one, one is to make crucibles to grow these artificial, uh, to grow uh, single crystal sapphire uh, things and some of these artificial diamonds that, that you can get real cheap now. Um, the other big use for iridium is to make spheres that they put plutonium in so that NASA, when they're sending some space shot to go and look at Pluto or beyond the, you know, the, the far planets where there's not very much solar radiation, they have to have something to power this satellite for 20 years or whatever, however long it takes to go to the other, uh, to the far edge of the uh, solar system. And so they put plutonium, which will generate heat, but they want to, they don't want it to melt. So they put it inside an iridium sphere. And so I remember once at Oak Ridge National Lab, I saw a file cabinet that supposedly contained 75% of the, the world's iridium. It was all in one file cabinet. That's what they told me anyway. I don't know if it's true. But in any case, there's not a lot of some materials. The material I was trying to get people to think of, they don't use silicon in cell phones. What do they use to go to higher frequencies? What semiconductor? Gallium arsenide. Well, arsenic is very plentiful. What about gallium? Gallium is about the price of silver. It's not the price of gold, but it's about the price of silver. Maybe a little higher than silver. But the problem is there are no real commercially viable gallium ores. And so gallium actually, most of the gallium we get in the world comes from scraping the, the soot uh, out of the stacks of utility plants. Because there's impurities in all the coal. You got the whole periodic table in the coal of the earth. And that stuff burns, and the gallium basically ends up depositing as a gallium oxide or a gallium sulfide on the walls of the, uh, the smokestack. And they go in there and they scrape that stuff off, and now they have a concentrated source of gallium. Concentrated, it's still probably a few parts per million, but it's more concentrated than anywhere else. Okay, fabricability. Well, there's lots of materials that are very, very easy to fabricate. One of the easiest to fabricate happens to be iron. Okay, um, ceramics are hard to fabricate in general. They don't have as uh, uh, because they're brittle. In fact, recyclability is getting to be more and more of an issue, and repairability is a significant issue. Uh, people like to talk about composites technology and how structural materials in the future are all going to be fancy composites. Um, well, one of the problems with uh, composites is if we look at this kind of um, criteria for selecting things, 
One is cost. I, I think I'm, did I mention this was part of this, the X-33 space plane? Did I tell you what the cost of this was the other day? They made something about the size of, actually about twice the size of this room. It was a liquid hydrogen tank. And it weighed 4,000 pounds and it cost $50 million. So what's that work out per pound? Do the math. $12,000 a pound fabricated for a composite structure. Now this is a little bit fancier than your average composite structure, but nonetheless, it's not necessarily cheap. And so one of the things that people usually ignore when they talk about advanced materials and selecting materials um, is the cost of the material. There's a guy, uh, a demagogue named a Amory Lovins out of the World Watch Institute or something in Aspen, Colorado, who goes around talking to the media and writing editorial letters to the editors and getting published, saying that all these people in Detroit are a bunch of idiots that they, we could build 100 mile per gallon vehicles if we wanted to. And he points to the advanced materials used for the space shuttle or, or something like that. And if we just use those types of materials in automobiles, we could have 100 miles per, per gallon vehicles. And you know, he's right. And the only thing he ignored was this little cost factor. You know, I can get much higher performance in automobiles than Detroit will sell me. And if you want to see it, all you have to do is go to Indianapolis in the spring. And there's this $1 million vehicle that performs better than anything Detroit builds. He's absolutely right. And if we all were willing to spend a $1 million a car, we could have 100 miles a gallon. But he doesn't point that out in any of his articles. He just he basically maligns all the automotive industry, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Yes. yes. It's the hypercar concept from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Oh, is that what it is? Yes. Okay. Rocky Mountain Institute. Okay. I thought we were talking okay. about last night. So. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Um, at one time, I think it was called World Watch, but it's, yeah, it's out there in Colorado where, you know, the people don't get enough air to breathe and it affects their brain. Um, anyway, this little fact is. Over the life of a vehicle, the value of a pound of weight saved for an automobile, if you take, you know, and you can plot the weight of a vehicle versus miles per gallon, and then you take the slope of that line, and you assume that an average car goes 100,000 miles before it's going to be trashed, you'll come up with $2 a pound. Plus or minus probably 25 cents. I mean, it's really, um, now, as gas prices go up, maybe it changes a little bit too, but in any case, for a commercial aircraft, it's $200 a pound. I remember when the LFM pro program started, one of the first theses around 1990 uh, was at Boeing, and they had a piece, of, a piece of proprietary Boeing data slipped into one of the students' theses. It was that a pound of weight saved was worth $188. Okay, so okay, $200, I've, I've rounded up. Um, did you know that some of the uh, commercial airlines, for someone to add anything, piece of permanent equipment, inside that aircraft requires the signature of a vice president? Because if you just go to heavier coffee pots, or you decide to carry more magazines okay, on that aircraft, it's $200 a pound over the 100,000 hour life of that vehicle. Th these are measured in miles, 100,000 miles, these are measured in hours of flight. And they're both roughly 100,000. But if you take the weight of an aircraft and the fuel consumed per mile and the cost of the jet fuel, you'll find it's $200 a pound. Now, if you go to something like, um, um, what was I going to say, a, uh, 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 a military aircraft, you're going to find that cost may go to $1,000 a pound. But then it also depends on where on the aircraft you're talking. If I'm talking about, um, and that's actually another, another overhead, which is right here. Okay. The faster something moves, the more valuable lightweight is. You know, I can use steel, which is a relatively heavy material, to build the Brooklyn Bridge. 
or to build some building because they don't move, or at least they're not supposed to, right? But if I want to build an aircraft, I'm Boeing, I'm going to build it out of aluminum, I'm not going to make a steel aircraft. It's too, steel's too heavy. But the faster something goes, the more I'm willing to pay to get lightweight. As a result, it turns out that on the turbine of an Air Force engine, I might not just be willing to pay $1,000 a pound, which is what a pound savings on the airframe of that, uh, that aircraft is. I might be willing to pay $20,000 or $30,000 a pound to save it on the compressor disc because that's going so fast that if I can lighten that engine, that means I can lighten the wing structure. Or if I lighten the engine, it means I can carry more payload in terms of bombs or range if I want to add fuel tanks. Okay, I can get more performance if I can make it lighter. And the faster it goes, in that case, out there in the engine, I'm willing to pay even more than $1,000 a pound for that. Um, if you look on an automobile, people are willing to pay more than $2 a pound to get weight out of what they call the sprung weight. That's the weight on the wheels, the brake calipers. Because things, that's all sprung. You know, that's the part that's bouncing on the road while you go along nice and smooth because of the, the suspension, right? But the sprung weight is more valuable than $2 a pound. Now, for spacecraft, we don't measure them in 100,000 hours of life, um, unfortunately. We do measure it, and what does it cost to put a payload up there? And it costs, anybody know what it costs to send the shuttle, what each shuttle flight costs? About a half a billion. Eh, maybe it's only 400 million. Depends on how you do your accounting for all those people in Houston sitting there watching the TV sets and stuff. But, you know, you throw away the tanks, okay, the big tank there. You got a lot of fuel there. You got a lot of overhead. It turns out, you look at the space shuttle budget of five or six billion dollars a year, and if they have a dozen flights a year, six billion dollars divided by 12, there's your number. Now, the space shuttle was supposed to get the cost down to a very, very low figure. It turns out when they, this X-33 space plane was supposed to drop the, fly, the price of getting into space from t uh, the space shuttle supposedly about $10,000 a pound uh, although I'm not sure if it has really gotten down that quite that low. But this, the X-33 space plane, and this, this is one of the hydrogen tanks. That's the oxygen tank, uh, H2O, right? One oxygen for every two hydrogens. You have to have two hydrogen tanks for the, ox the single oxygen tank for your fuel. In any case, um, the goal of the X-33 space plane, which was called single-staged orbit, you don't throw anything into the ocean afterwards. You actually return everything except the fuel back to Earth afterwards uh, for re reuse. So the single-staged or orbit was supposed to get the cost into space down to $1,000 a pound. And so people say, I mean, you read articles. People say, oh, well, we're going to have space travel in the future. Well, I hope we do, because you know that means we're all going to be very wealthy, right? What did it cost for the guy who wanted to you know, fly with the Soviets? $20 million. Now, it's Soviet economy, but you know, I don't know how much he weighed, but he's not way off, you know, 200 pounds. I mean, he was paying $10,000 a pound to get into space. Uh, is that right, 20 million? No, he was paying, yeah, he was paying something like that. No, he's paying $100,000. He was paying, a fact, everybody thought it was a huge amount, but he was, pay, he was only paying about a factor of 10 above what it costs to get, get the payload up there. Um, so the Soviets made some money off of them, but not as much as everybody thinks. Um, it's not cheap to do these things. Well, the last thing that we have time for today is to tell you about advanced materials a la Bob Sprague. Bob Sprague was head of GE Aircraft Engine Materials Group for many years. And Sprague's first law is when you first hear something, when you hear something about a new material, write it down because it may be the best thing you'll ever hear about the material. Okay? Material scientists will tell you how wonderful things are. What was it 1988 that I was sitting one New Year's uh, at a friend's house down in 
uh, New Jersey, and I read about high temperature superconductors or whatever. They discovered superconductivity at 30 degrees Kelvin uh, or 77 degrees. I don't remember which one it was. Um, and the people were predicting that within five years, we'd all be riding on superconducting levitated trains. And I remember taking my first trip in 1993, right? No, no. Um, in fact, I'm still waiting. And in fact, some of us said back then that we wouldn't be riding on superconducting trains for a long time. Uh, and I got, I got chewed out big time a number of times for saying that. One, one faculty member took me to the dean because I once said that we wouldn't be riding on superconducting levitated trains in our lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetimes. And he said I was wrong. Okay, well I have grandchildren now, so um, anyway. Um, Williams Corollary, Jim Williams now Dean at Ohio State, but he took over Bob Sprague's job. His is, when you hear the price of a new material, write it down, because that's the lowest price you're ever going to hear for that material. So the proper, as time goes on with advanced materials, the properties come down and the price goes up. And that's just a rule of anybody who has ever worked with these things. Jim Williams likes to talk about advanced materials. And let's face it, he's in the aircraft engine business. They are willing to embrace any great new material if it's really going to do something for them. He calls these advanced materials that people are always talking about in the Wall Street Journal and other, other uh, fictitious articles, or uh, I, I consider the Wall Street Journal technology reviews to be on the equivalent of the National Enquirer um, in terms of quality of reporting. But he calls them boutique materials. Okay, Boutique because someone in the laboratory produced a pound or two but no one is going to produce a thousand pounds because there's not a market for it. The only people who are going to buy it is NASA. Okay, and I don't care if you do sell a thousand pounds at ten thousand dollars a pound. It may cost you twelve thousand dollars a pound to make that thousand pounds, but you're not going to sell a million tons. And so this cost, availability, fabricability, there are many dimensions to choosing a material. And most of what you hear about Advanced materials is bogus. It considers one dimension of the multi dimensions of selecting a structural material. And it's, it's either propounded by people who are intentionally deceiving or are just plain ignorant. And they may have, they may be, they may have a doctorate from a prestigious university and, you know, be very well known material scientists. But I will sta state it again. They're either ignorant or they're intentionally deceiving you. So you can make your choice about which one it is. But advanced materials for structural materials is a very hard problem. It's not like Amory Lovin says, is all everybody's idiots in Detroit and doesn't know how to build a hundred, uh, will not build a hundred mile per vehicle, per, per, per gallon car. If we knew how to do it, I bet you I could get a very big com competitive advantage if I could. But it's not an easy problem because there are m multiple dimensions and there are some fundamental things like thermodynamics, energy cost, that are limiting me. So I'll see you again tomorrow, and we'll finish up some stuff on selection of materials. Thanks. Thanks.